Okay. Um, well, today we uh, our subject is um, verse e 11 of Uludu But before we start on verse 11 of Uludu Napdu, since it, today is Deepam, I thought it would be nice to start with uh, the verse that Bhagavan wrote um, 86 years ago on Deepam Day, explaining uh, the significance of seeing Deepam, Deepadashana Tatvam. In this verse, Bhagavan's, this is a particularly nice verse because while explaining the, um, the significance, Bhagavan actually is very, very clearly explaining the core of his teachings and uh, what is the practice. So in this verse he says, Itano veina nam enumatie nitap buddhi idiate porundiaha no kal aduvitama me aha chudakan ge bu madianum anamale chudakan ge chudakan me ye. The meaning of this is, Itano veina nam. This body alone is I, enum matie nitap, giving up or, or separating ourselves from this um, this mati, that can mean the mind or the awareness, I am this body, um, which is, but as Bhagavan explains so many times, the, the ego is nothing but the false awareness, I am this body. Um, so s giving this up and then... Uh, a buddhi idiyate porandiya porandi that means um, the mind uh, abiding or being fixed or being uh, firmly yeah, firmly fixed in the heart uh, and then he gives the means aha no kal aha no kal literally means by looking at it can either mean looking within because aha can mean within it can also mean looking at I by by looking within or by looking at I, that is by self-attentiveness, fixing the mind in the heart, or the mind being fixed in the heart, or the mind abiding in the heart by self-attentiveness, thereby giving up the, um, <coughs> the, the, the false awareness, I am this body. Um, but this is all, these are all um, adverbial clauses. The main, um, the main clause, is, or the main subject is, uh, Aduvita ma me ahachurakange. That means seeing the, um, the inner light of a light, of, the real inner light of a light of the real eye, which is Advaita, the non dual, uh, so the non dual light of uh, the real eye. That means our real self awareness. Um, that, that is the subject of the sentence. So seeing that as a by implication, as a result of fixing the mind in the heart by um, uh, self-attentiveness, by looking at I, and uh, that is, and uh, thereby giving up the uh, false awareness, the ego, I am this body. Bu um, madianum anamale, anamale, which is uh, um, which is called the center of the world. Um, uh, Chudakan me Chudakan Meye. That is uh, that is the uh, the truth or the significance of seeing the light on an which is um, which is called uh, which is called the center of the world. Um, this that this, even this uh, clause, which is called the center of the. Uh, um, Bhumadi Enum, which is called the center of the world, even that has a, a very deep significance because what it, our, our whole experience of any, whatever world we may experience ourselves in, whether this world or in any other dream, whatever world we experience ourselves in, the center of the world is ourself. The whole, the whole world, now we take ourselves to be the body. So when we say, when we talk about here, that means the point where the body is. When we talk about now, it's the point where, where it, the, here is the point in space where the body is. Now is the point in time where the body is. So that is which body? The body which I take to be myself. So what is actually the center, though I as this ego, identified with this body, seem to be the center of the world, what is the center of this ego 
is the I. What is real in the ego is only I. The body is an adjunct that comes and goes. This body we experience as I in the waking state. In dream we experience some other body as I. In sleep we experience no body as I. So whatever body we experience as I is only an adjunct, something added to us. So the essence of the ego, the center of the ego, is the um, is the um, is um, is the, the real I, what we actually are. So the, the pure self-awareness. So since this ego always experiences itself as the central point in space and in time, the, the point here and now, that is it, it, in, in that sense the ego is the center of the world and the center of the ego is the real I, which is an anomaly. So it, it, there's so much uh, deep meaning packed into this verse in which Bhagavan is explaining the meaning of seeing uh, Deepam. So th this is uh, particularly on this day, this is a very important verse to remember because this is the core of Bhagavan's teaching. The whole of Bhagavan's teaching is and what Bhagavan's teachings are, what is the, Bhagavan has diagnosed, what is the root problem that we all face? It is this ego. And the ego is that false awareness that experiences, that, that adjunct bound awareness that experiences itself, that is aware of itself as this body alone is I. So that has to be given up. How to give it up? By fixing the mind in the heart by looking at I, by self-attentiveness. And thereby we will see the light of the real I that is seen deeper. So this is a very, very uh, beautiful and significant verse, and an important verse to remember particularly today. Um, so now coming to our main subject, um, verse 11 of Uludunapadu. Um, this is all the verses are, are, are a, there's a connection between all the verses that is that each verse is leading in a in a logical sequence Bhagavan is um, a logical and very systematic way Bhagavan is dealing with the subject for example in the first verse he talks about because we see the world what we can infer from the fact that we see the world we can infer that there is one original thing that has a power to become many. This is not the only possible inference, but Bhagavan says this is the best inference. Um, and he says all the, everything that is experienced, the picture of names and forms, the one who sees it, the screen on which it's seen, and the light by which it's seen, all these are that one thing. Then in verses 2 and 3, he gives us a warning. Though we, um, though um, what what he's teaching us in Uludunapadu, it is for it is for one purpose and one purpose alone. In order to for us to get rid of the ego, which is the root of all the problem. So, Bhagavan warns us. Even if we accept all that he says in Uludunapadu, the purpose of accepting it is to turn our attention within and erect in order to eradicate the ego. It is not to uh, arise as an ego and argue with others. So he, in verse 2 he says, each religion first accepts three fundamentals, world, soul and God. Contending that one fundamental standard, these three fundamentals or three fundamentals stand are always three fundamentals, is possible only so long as the ego exists. This applies to any argument. Whatever we, however strongly we believe in Bhagavan's teachings, the purpose is not to argue with others. People, everyone believes what they, what, according to their level of uh, spiritual development, their level of maturity, people have so many different beliefs. Nobody is, there's never going to be a day when everyone's going to accept Bhagavan's teachings. If we accept Bhagavan's teachings, that's enough. We have to, we have to imbibe his teachings, put them in practice, turn within. Therefore he concludes that verse by saying, by destroying I, the ego, standing in the real state of oneself is best. 
and he continues the warning in the next verse what is the use of disputing the world is real it's an unreal appearance the world is sentient it's not the world is happening is it not leaving all such arguments and all thought about the world investigating oneself and thereby separating oneself from all these disputes that state in which I the ego has thereby perished is agreeable to all so in these two verses Bhagavan very clearly emphasizes what is the purpose of Uddhanaptu then in verse 4 he begins to develop the subject that he took up in verse 1 which is because we see the world so he says if oneself is a world the world um, sorry if oneself is a form the world and God will be likewise so the world appears as a myriad names and forms because we take ourselves as a form if oneself is not a form who can see their forms and and how how to do so, so can what is seen be otherwise than the nature of the eye so if we take ourselves to be a form everything will appear as form if, but he said the real eye is oneself that means one's real nature that is the infinite eye um, I there means I as in the organ of sight um, and then he continues the same subject he says what is the body he's what is the form he's referring to there it's a body uh, but that body is not just a physical form it's a form of five sheaths so all the five sheaths are included in the term body without a body, a body consisting of these five sheaths the five sheaths means the physical form the life the mind the intellect and the basic uh, self-ignorance um, without such a body is there a world uh, without a body has anyone seen a world um, and then in the next verse he said what is this world it's, it's simply a form of five uh, types of uh, sensory perception five kinds of uh, sense data we can say um, sensor, sensory impressions apart from sights sounds uh, tastes smells and tactile sensations where is any world there's no world apart from these things so he says the world is not anything but these five kinds of sense impressions these five kinds of sense impressions are, are, um, uh, are, um, are relative are, are each, each, is applicable, each is applicable to one of the five sense organs since the mind alone perceives the world by way of the five sense organs is there any world besides the mind and then in verse 7 he uh, so first he says that there's no world apart from the body and there's no world apart from the mind then in 7 he wraps up the whole subject by saying though the world and the mind rise and subside simultaneously the world shines only by the mind but then having he started off by saying because we see the world and from the fact that we see the world he inferred the existence he said that we can infer the existence of one model one one fundamental thing one primary thing which has a power to appear as many so in verse 7 he 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 says what is that one fundamental thing he doesn't use the word model here he uses the word poral which means the real substance in this context he says only that which shines without appearing and disappearing as the base for the appearing and disappearing of the world of mind is poral which is pundram yeah. pundram means the infinite whole it means pu, pu, it's a kind of form of the word Sanskrit word purna which means um, whole or full so it means everything the totality of all that is so this this, this what is the real substance we see all these names and forms like so many ornaments made of gold but well, what actually are all those ornaments made of gold they're nothing but gold the, the the forms they take are unreal because they come and they go you can melt down a ring and make it into a necklace or into a gold brick or whatever uh, the form is not what is real because forms are transient what is real is the gold the substance that as far as that analogy is concerned but I mean that's an analogy for the sense in which Bhagavan uses the word poral here this is the real substance and in the first verse he says all the everything the picture of names and forms the seer 
the screen and the light, all are tana mavan. That means the, that fundamental, that one fundamental, which is oneself, that's, which is our real nature. And here he says it, he refers to it as poro, the substance. So, but when Murugana asked Bhagavan to compose all the um, he made a very, very simple request, which he expressed in the prefatory verse, the Pyram verse, but he wrote for it afterwards. Uh, he, that is, he asked, Mayin ilbum adu mayvum tiranam. That is, he was asking Bhagavan, reveal to us mayin ilbum, the nature of reality, adu mayvum tiranam, the means to attain or to experience it. So, in, up in verse 7, he explains what is the nature of reality. It is only that which shines without appearing and disappearing as the base of the appear, as the base of a, a um, Adara means, um, and she uses the Tamil word idam there, but it, it means in this context the same as Adara, which means, often it's translated as base, but it also means a container, that in which everything is contained. Um, that is poro. Uh, that, so it, it doesn't appear or disappear, that means it's permanently, it's what we constantly experience. But in other words, it's our, our own fundamental self-awareness, but it is the base and the the the, um, the location or the place for the appearance of and disappearance of the world and the mind. Um, so he's now the, so here he explains me and ilbu the nature of uh, um, of reality. But then the main uh, purpose of Nafu, we don't just want to know theoretically what the uh, what is the nature of reality? We want to actually experience it. So, uh, in verse 8, Bhagavan talks about how to see this poral, this real substance. Um, people generally conceive of that reality as God. And they have a, a mental image of God as some name or form. Um, even if they've got an idea that God is nameless and formless, the idea that they have of God is itself a form. So Bhagavan starts by saying, whoever worships uh, in whatever form, giving whatever name, that is the way to see that poral in name and form. That is, though the poral is nameless and formless, if we conceive it, if we, if we, um, if we conceive of it as a name and form, and worship that name and form, with the love that we are worshipping that reality, that is the way to see it in name and form. However, knowing the reality of oneself and thereby subsiding in and becoming one with the reality of that true substance alone is seen in reality. So, he, Bhagavan here says, what is the real seeing? It's not seeing God in name and form. In a later verse, he says that seeing God in name and form is seeing a, a Manumayam Amkarchi, that is a mental image, a, a mental um, a form, a mental um, perception. So that is not the real seeing. Real seeing is only when one sees oneself and the, sees the reality of oneself. Oneself here means the ego. The reality of oneself is the poral. So when one sees the reality of oneself, the, as this ego we subside and become one with that reality, uh, and um, that alone is seeing in reality, Bhagavan says. So worshipping in name and form is the way to see in name and form. Knowing one's own reality is the way to see it in reality. So we have a choice. Do we want to see it in name and form or do we want to see it in reality? Seeing in name and form is not the real seeing. So so from verse 8 he's talking about seeing, how to see. But then Bhagavan begins to analyse what is the nature of seeing? Seeing here means being aware of or knowing. So in verse 9 he begin, he talks about dyads and triads. Dyads are pairs of opposites, knowledge, ignorance, um, uh, happiness, unhappiness, existence, non-existence, um, likes, dislikes, uh, desires, fears, 
any pair of opposites, they're, they're all included in dyads and triads, but the most in, fundamental of all the dyads is knowledge and ignorance. Um, and triads, triads mean the three factors of, um, of, um, of w when we know things other than ourselves, we've got ourself as the knower, the thing we know is what is known, and there's our knowing of it. So these are three things, the knower, the knowing, and the known. Um, so Bhagavan says these dyads and triads, they ex exist by clinging only to one thing. What is the one thing they cling to? For, in whose view do dyads exist? In whose view is, is there an, uh, awareness of things other than ourselves? It's only in the view of the ego. So the one thing that they cling to or depend on is the ego. And then he says, if one looks within the mind to see what that one is, so instead of seeing what is seen, if we try to see what is seeing, in other words, we try to see the seer, ourself, this ego, they will cease to exist. Why will they cease to exist? Because, as he explains later, they, um, for example, in verse 14, he says, if the first person exists, second and third persons will exist. But if we investigate the truth of the first person, the, um, the first person will cease to exist and along with it the second and third persons will cease to exist. The same is implied here. If we look within the mind to see what is the one uh, the one uh, which supports this knowledge and uh, this diads and triads, in other words, the ego, that one being the ego is unreal. When we see the, the reality of ourself, the ego will cease to exist and when it ceases to exist, in the absence of the ego, we are dyads and triads. In sleep, we are aware of ourself, but we're not aware of ourself as the ego. Because we're not aware of ourself as the ego, there are no dyads and triads, there's nothing. We're not aware of anything, we are just simply aware. Just being aware, that is our real nature. So, uh, it's only when the ego rises that dyads and triads seem to, uh, 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 seem to exist. And then he ends that verse by saying, only those who have seen, have seen the reality. That means only those who have seen this, the, the cessation of the ego and the, all its, all the, its dyads and triads, have seen the reality. That, see, they will not be confused. Because they have seen what is real, they will never be, they will never again see what is unreal, so they will never again be confused. That's the implication. Then in verse 10, which was the verse we discussed last month, he, he begins to talk, he goes still deeper into this subject of, because, as I said, from verse 8, Bhagavan talking about seeing or knowing. Um, so he, in verse 9, he talks about the, the, uh, the knowing of things other than ourselves, which consists of a dyad, the knower, the known, and the knowing. Um, but... In, in, from verse, verse 10, 11, 12 and 13 he, begins to, he goes so deep into the subject he first says without ignorance knowledge does not exist without knowledge ignorance does not exist that is it, knowledge and ignorance are a pair of, uh, of um, they're, they're a dyad a pair of opposites um, only when we come to know something we come to know but we were previously ignorant of it. So the, since nothing exists apart from our awareness of it, according to the principles of Bhagavan's teaching, um, it's only our ignorance of something, our prior ignorance of something, comes into existence at the same time as our knowledge of that thing. Because that thing didn't exist, either for us to know or not know, before um, we knew it, we came to know it. Um, so, without ignorance, knowledge doesn't exist. Without knowledge, ignorance doesn't exist. Um, in in sleep, we are not ignorant of anything because there's nothing for us to be ignorant of, and there's not we do, there's nothing for, uh, for us to be ignorant of because we don't know anything. So it's only when we know something that. Either we know that we, our knowledge of it is limited, but in other words, we know that we, we sometimes we say, um, 
I don't know much about that subject. We know there is a subject. We know um, we know um, there's a subject, say, let's say, medieval Indian history. Um, but we don't know much about it. We know there was a before the, the Mughals came to India, there um, there was some history, but we've got very little knowledge about it. We may know a little bit about the, the Gupta dynasty or this or that, but, and the Chola dynasty in the south, and but we don't really know much about it because we've not studied the subject. So, because we've got a little knowledge about it, we know that we're ignorant of the rest of it. So, so scientists are very aware of their ignorance. The more they know, the more they know what they don't know. Um, it's like that with any subject. So knowledge and ignorance are inseparable. It's basically what everyone is saying there. But to whom are that knowledge and ignorance? They're only for the ego. So Bhagavan says, only the knowledge that knows oneself, who is the first to appear, who is the first, he says, that means the first to appear, um, by investigating to whom are that knowledge and ignorance is knowledge. Here knowledge, the, the word Bhagavan uses is Arivu, which means though one meaning of it is Arivu, it, it has a much um, broader and deeper meaning than the English word knowledge, because it, it not only means knowledge, it also means awareness. So Bhagavan is using it both in the sense of knowledge and in the sense of awareness. So if we translated as awareness, what Bhagavan is saying here, only the awareness that is aware of oneself, that means aware of the reality of oneself, oneself being the ego, only the knowledge that knows the reality of the ego, which is what knows, which, which, which is that to which knowledge and ignorance occur, is knowledge. That is, the, the ego is, it's, it's the knowledge and ignorance of uh, appear only to the ego. When the ego rises in waking and sleep, all its knowledge and ignorance also, sorry, in waking and dream, all its knowledge and ignorance comes into existence. When the ego subsides in sleep, there's no ego, and hence there's no knowledge or ignorance. That, so, but what remains, that is the real awareness. So only the awareness that knows oneself is, a, is real awareness, is the implication of verse uh, 10. So now we come to verse 11, which is the verse we are um, to discuss this time. Um, the first sentence, um, uh, in the first sentence Bhagavan says, um, Arivurum tanne ariyadu, ayale arivudu, ariyame angi arivo. This is a, um, a rhetorical question, but it's the syntax of it in Tamil is difficult to convey in English because if it were the implication of this rhetorical question, um, ayale uh, arivudu, ariyame angi arivo. The implication of this is, um, ayale means other, other things, anything other than ourselves. So knowing things other than ourselves um, is ignorance, and the aribo. Uh, if it were put as a positive sentence, well, the, let's say the implication of this rhetorical question is that knowing other things is not knowledge but only ignorance. But in English we can't say, um, we, we, we I mean, Andri there represents um, only this, not uh, is not this, only that. That that's what implied by the Andri here, which we can say in a positive sentence in English: knowing other things is not knowledge, but only ignorance. But in a question, in a rhetorical, we can't form that into a rhetorical question. But that is that's possible in Tamil. So in English, for Simplifying the translation, it's easier to split it as two things. Knowing other things is ignorance, besides that, can it be knowledge? That's the only way of making it, uh, forming it as a question in English. Um, but he, uh, in the di I mean, the main subject is knowing um, knowing other things. Ayale uh, Arivadu, and that is ignorance, not, not, not knowledge. Um, but he, add, he also gives a, um, 
an adverbial clause there, arivurum tanne ariadu, uh, without knowing oneself who knows. Um, this, the sentence, even without this, the sentence would still stand. I mean, ILA aridu ariame is a basic principle of Bhagavan teaching. Knowing anything other than ourselves is ignorance, not knowledge. Um, but he added this there just to, um, to, to emphasize the fact when do we know things other than ourselves? Only when we don't know ourselves. If we know ourselves, there's nothing else to be known. As he says in, in, in verse 12, of, in the, the verse we'll be dealing with next month, and also in verse, um, I think, uh, 27 of, of um, I think it's 27 of Upadesha India, in which he says, um, that there's nothing else to be known. Um, <coughs> so, um, so, because we don't know what we are so far, we know we are aware of other things. That, Bhagavan says, that is ignorance. It is not knowledge. Um, in the Kali Bhemba version, Bhagavan extended the first phrase. The first phrase is, Ari Vurum Tanne. That means oneself who knows. To that, Bhagavan added another word, Ariba uh, Arivurum Ari Tanne. Ariba is, um, it's, uh, for those of you who know Tamil, it's an, it's an archaic form of the neuter third person plural participial, participial noun, that Aribave. In, in ancient Tamil, Aribave would simply Ariba. And so this, uh, this more archaic form of the word is often used by Bhagavan and Murugana and such poets in Tamil because it's, it, more meaning can be packed in smaller space by using the briefer form. So Ariba means Aribave, which, uh, which um, means those that are known and implies those things that are known. Um, so, uh, so there he says, oneself who knows those things that are known. Um, since he says in this sentence, "Ile aribdu ariame," knowing other things is ignorant. He implies that whatever knows other things is ignorant. If knowing other things is ignorant, whatever knows other things must be ignorant. So. So the clear implication is that what knows other things is not ourself as we actually are, but only ourself as this ego. So here, Tanne, oneself, refers to, uh, um, the, refers to the um, ego. Um, so the ego is, is, uh, is what knows um, things other than itself. Uh, but, but what knows, uh, well, Ariba, Ariba means things that are known, um, which is what he refers to also in this sentence, ILA, other things. Um, so, it, it, um, yeah, so, um, so that's the ego Bhagavan is referring to there. So, um, when he says not knowing oneself, he means not knowing the, the truth about oneself, not knowing the reality of oneself, this ego. Um, when Bhagavan made Uludu Napadu into, um, into a, a Kali Vemba form, he emphasized this point in several places that what knows things other than itself is the ego. He, he, the, extension he added to this, the first sentence of this verse is Ariba, which means those things that are known. Likewise, in, the, in verse 20, he, he added the word uh, Sabave, which in that context means those things that appear. And in verse 22, he added the, um, the relative clause, Ebeum Karnam, which sees everything. Um, uh, um, Sabave he, he added to um, uh, Karnam Tanne 
so oneself who sees those things who are that appear. And ebeyum karnam, he added to mati, which means mind. Ebeyum karnam mati. Uh, so the mind which sees everything. So in all these three cases, what he implies is that what sees or is aware of everything other than ourself is only ourself as this ego or mind. Um, um, then in the next verse, sorry, sorry, in the next sentence, in the final, there are just two sentences in this verse. The next sentence he says, when one, um, uh, Arivu Ayaku, uh, Ayaku here, Ay Ayaku is a dative form of Ayo, it means the other. Um, in this context, was he talk he's been talking about this dyad of knowledge and ignorance, in this context, I, I, I all refers to the ignorance. So, um, uh, in, he said, Arivu Ayaku Adara Tanne Arya. When one knows oneself, the support or base or container for knowledge and ignorance, knowledge and the other, which means knowledge and ignorance, uh, Arivu Ariyame Arum. Knowledge and ignorance will cease. Why will they cease? Because they exist only in the view of the ego. When we know um, our, uh, when we know ourselves, that's when we know the reality of ourselves, this ego, which is the base for knowledge <coughs> and ignorance, the, the reality, when we know the reality of ourselves, we will no longer seem to be this ego. So the ego will cease to exist, and along with it, all its knowledge and ignorance will cease to exist. <laughs> Um, uh, so but the implication of this sense is when one knows the reality of oneself, the ego, the adara, which is the adara or support foundation or container for knowledge and ignorance, knowledge and ignorance of everything else will cease. Because the reality of the ego is a pure self-awareness, so when one knows oneself with pure self-awareness, the ego will no longer seem to exist. <coughs> And hence, all its knowledge and ignorance will cease to along, exist along with it. Um, in the Kalivemba version, Bhagavan uh, intensified the final verb. The final verb is arum, which means will cease. He appended the intensifying suffix a. So arum became uh, arum a, which means will, will definitely cease or will actually cease. Um, so he, he's just adding a little bit more emphasis there uh, uh, to um, to that final word, well, uh, uh, final verb, so emphasizing that they were, they will definitely cease. That no knowledge and ignorance can survive the destruction of the ego. They don't even survive in sleep. So how can they survive in the absence of the um, ego? <coughs> <coughs> so I think I've talked for quite a long time today. I hope what I was saying was clear and that everyone was able to follow it. But the thing is, in Ulladunabdu, there's so many... We, it's, in Ulladunabdu, it's a, it's a very um, coherent exposition of the nature of reality and the means of attaining it. Coherent means what holds together. So there's so many connections. Every verse, there's so many connections between verses in different parts of the text. So we have to, we have to understand each verse individually, and we also have to understand in the context of the whole work. Because if we take the verses out of context, many of the verses can be very easily misinterpreted. In a lot of translations, Uruginapu has been misinterpreted because people don't aren't making the connection between the verses and uh, so they're not understanding what it, like but we're not using the word tan or tan or it's cutesy form tanne which means oneself in some places he uses that word to refer to the what we actually are our real nature atmosarupa in many cases he uses it to refer to the ego so we have to understand from the context which it refers to in which uh, case. 
But we, when we, un, when we have a, a coherent understanding of religion after as a whole, we will understand that in many, many cases, he's using it to refer to the ego, but in various English translations, it's been translated as the self, which is completely missing the point of what Bhagavan is talking about. According to Bhagavan, the whole problem is the ego. The ego is the base for knowledge and ignorance. The ego is, when the ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. When the ego is not, everything is not. So Bhagavan is constantly emphasizing the root problem is the ego. The only, sol the only real solution to all our problems is to get rid of the ego. If you cut the root, the whole tree dies. So Bhagavan, whether he's, whether it's in Ulladhinapya or whether it's in Aksharam, like the very first verse of Aksharam, like what Bhagavan says, Arunachala mena ahame nene pava ahate verarupai arunachala. You root out the ego. So the whole aim of why why Arunachala appears as a, as first as a column of fire between Brahma and Vishnu, and later took the form of a hill. To teach, uh, to, it was only to teach the annihilation of the ego. That is what, and the same Aranatra has appeared in human form as Bhagavan to teach us the same thing. So, this is what Bhagavan's teaching is all about. It's all about this root problem, the ego. In, in older um, uh, Advaita texts, they say that the, um, the root problem is um, avidya, ignorance. But for whom is ignorance? They, the, the, the exponents of, uh, of a greater philosophy after Shankara, they got themselves in a great, they actually divided into two main schools. One main school says it's Brahman who is ignorant because they, they, they argue that the jiva can't be ignorant because um, uh, because uh, ignorance is the root problem and the jiva arises out of ignorance therefore it must be Brahman who is ignorant and the other side said no it's the jiva who is ignorant but then they, they got in so many arguments Bhagavan has simplified everything Bhagavan said the root problem isn't ignorance the root problem is who is ignorant <laughs> who we are, this ego is so the ego is the root problem so Bhagavan has, has simplified and clarified Remove so many confusions that existed in the older Advaitic texts. It's, it's so Bhagavan has given us the um, he's given us the Amrita. The, the uh, Advaita mm -hmm. philosophy is the Amrita of the whole of the Vedas. When the ocean of the Vedas are churned, what comes out is Advaita. When the ocean of Advaita is churned, what comes out is Bhagavan's teachings. If we talk about knowing ourself, since we are not an object, knowing ourself it doesn't involve a triad. Because the knowing, when we talk about knowing ourself, the knowing is simply awareness, which is our real nature. So in self knowledge, self awareness, that which is aware, that of which it is aware, and its being aware of it are all one and the same thing because its very nature is self-awareness. But when we talk about knowing anything other than ourself, then you've got the triad, the dyad. You've got ourself as a knower, the ego as a knower, the subject. You've got the things known, the object. And you've got 
the ego knowing those things. So there you've got the uh, triad. So the triad applies to um, um, objective knowledge, that knowledge of things other than oneself. Knowledge of oneself is beyond the uh, triad, because there is only one thing there. That which knows, that which is known, and the, and the knowing of that thing is all one and the same thing. Okay. <clears throat> then, uh, to me, as a person who is still ignorant, I understand knowing here, knowing other things than we are as ourselves, is actually not fun, you know, because uh, what is the special, what is the special thing that we know ourselves uh, while knowing other things seems to be more beneficial. Knowing other things is more beneficial. Yes, That's to me as an ignorant person. <laughs> because the ego can survive only by knowing things other than itself. Bhagavan says in verse 25, he says, Uru patri undam, uru patri nekum, uru patri undu meka ongum. Uru vittu, uru patrum, um, uh, uru vatra peya hande. That is, oh, te dinal otum patikum. That is what that means is, the ego is a formless phantom, he says. But it comes into existence, uru patri means grasping form. Grasping form means how, if it's a formless phantom, how can something that is formless grasp anything? It hasn't got any hands or legs or, or hands or anything to grasp it. We grasp in our awareness. So being aware, what Bhagavan implies by Urupatri is being aware of things other than ourselves. So by being aware of things other than ourselves, we come into existence as this ego. By being aware of things other than ourselves, we stand as this ego. Um, by um, being a, by urupati undu, that means uh, grasping and feeding on form. <coughs> so by it, it's the, the being aware of things other than ourselves is for food, but uh, nourishes this ego. So he said urupati undu mika ongom. It uh, flourishes abundantly. So as this ego, definitely we need to know things other than ourselves. But unfortunately, knowing things other than ourselves is very tiring. So every 16 hours or so, we, we get tired of knowing other things. We can't continue knowing other things. Though we've got so many desires to know other things, we reach a point where we're so exhausted, we, we subside into sleep. When the ego subsides, we don't know anything. But we don't cease to exist in sleep, do we? So we don't actually need to know anything other than ourselves to exist. We need to know things other than ourselves to exist as this ego, but we don't need things other than ourselves to exist as we really are. As you say, it is because of our ignorance that we, this is, and this ignorance is, it's, the ego itself is ignorance. The very nature of the ego is ignorance, because what is the ego? It is nothing but the, a wrong self-awareness, the erroneous self-awareness, I am this body. Pure self-awareness is aware of itself only I, as I am, not as I am this or that. But the e ego is always aware of itself as I am this or that. I am this body, I am a person called Michael, um, I am sitting here in London talking to people, to you who are sitting there in Houston. Everything, it's all it's all a, a, an erroneous awareness of myself. Instead of being aware of myself just as I am, I'm aware of myself as I am Michael, I am this body. I am so many years old, I am here, not there, all these things. So the ego itself is ignorance. And to maintain its ignorance, it needs to be aware of other things. And Bhagavan said, being aware of other things, ILA Ari Vadu Ariyame. Being aware of anything other than ourself is ignorance, Bhagavan says. Okay, thank you, Michael. <laughs> but 
Though we can though we can say this and understand it at the, at the, the surface level of our mind, none of us really understood Sanjay. If we were really convinced by what Bhagavan said, our attention would turn within and we would merge back into the source. We are still why we are still clinging to things other than ourselves? Because we we don't yet fully understand what Bhagavan has said. Why don't we understand it? Because we don't yet want, we don't really don't want to understand it. We still think we get happiness from the things of the world. We still think that knowing things of the, wor of the world is real knowledge. Supposing in your dream last night, you, you studied a very interesting book, and you woke up thinking, oh, I've learned so much. And then suddenly you remember, oh, it was only a dream. All that I read in that, in that history book or that science book, it was all a dream. So it may not be, it's, it's all just a figment of my imagination. It's not real knowledge. What you learn in a dream is not knowledge. According to Bhagavan, this is, this, uh, our present state is just a dream. So all that we know now is not real knowledge, it's only ignorance according to Bhagavan. So Michael, yes. what would come first? The detachment and the desire to know self or the self-realization and then as a result all the other things will happen. So you're, you're asking whether which comes first, the, the knowledge or the, or the love to have the knowledge, is that it? Yeah. Okay, according to Bhagavan, Bhakti is the mother of jnana. So, without we, why why are we all sitting here talking about this subject? We could be doing so many other things. It's a it's a Saturday. Well, for you it's a Saturday morning. For me it's a Saturday afternoon. We could be watching football. We could be um, going to the pub and drinking. We could be doing so so many things. People spend their weekends doing. They may go on a short holiday, a skiing holiday, or something. So many things we could be doing. Why we choose to be sitting here talking about this subject? Bhagavan has put a seed of interest on this subject in our heart. He has sown that seed. And now we, we, we find this subject more and more fascinating. We keep on being drawn back to it. Though we know this, this is a suicide mission, studying and practicing Bhagavan's teaching we are on a suicide mission. We're like a moth flying round a flame. Sooner or later we're going to get too close to a flame and we're going to get burned. And we know that. But still we can't, we can't leave this flame. It, somehow it's attracted us and we can't leave it. So Bhagavan had put the seed of, of love in our heart. And he is, not, he is never going to cheat us. He himself prayed to Arunachala. Mesa Milenakun, me who had no love, to me who had no love, Unase Kartane, Mosanchea Daral Aranachala, to me who had no love for you, you planted that, you, you, you gave me that, uh, that little bit of desire for you. Do not cheat me. Though Bhagavan said that as a prayer, I take that as an assurance. Having once put the, the seed of love in our heart, having once kindled that interest in our heart, we, we may not be uh, sincerely following what Bhagavan has taught us. We may not yet have enough love. But he, once, when the, Bhagavan is such a gardener, when he plants, a, when he sows a seed, he will work, water it and nurture it and he will make sure that seed grows into a... Uh, a beautiful flowering plant. We may not be ready to flower yet, but we have been tended by a, the best gardener in the world. And he will ensure that he will give us the water, he will give us the nourishment, he will give us all the favorable circumstances. And if the winter comes, he'll take us into a greenhouse to keep us, to protect us from the cold. He'll do all that is necessary to ensure that one day we'll be ready to flower. So, um, if 
Pentecostal smells reminded me of um, uh, Paul Young, the um, psychologist. Sorry, I, I, I can't I can't hear you very clearly. So the Kevas question, um, <laughs> earlier question, reminded me of uh, an incident uh, in Paul Young. Uh, apparently somebody asked, why don't you why didn't you go and uh, see Bhagwan? I mean you seem to be really impressed, uh, something to that effect and then then uh, and um, Paul Young apparently responded um, that he's actually afraid of being in a permanent place at all time. Uh, you heard about this and, and uh, what are your comments on that? Yeah. I, I think he didn't actually say he was afraid. I think that was what people inferred. What he said apparently to, to Dr. Meads, who he, who, um, wanted to take him to Bhagavan. He said, I I saw all of India in the eyes of a boy in a bus stand. Standing on the street side, I saw the depth of India in the eyes of that boy. There's no, no need for me to see anything more. From okay. which uh, Dr. Mees inferred that he was, actually he was afraid to see Bhagavan because he had built up his whole, his whole life work was based on uh, uh, his research on the mind. Okay. But Bhagavan says if you research the mind correctly by turning within to see what is this I, <clears throat> you will find there's no such thing as mind at all. So the whole of Jung's, um, the whole of Jung's, uh, all his uh, life work, all his theories and everything would all amount to nothing if he were to accept Bhagavan's teachings. So, <laughs> like all of us, he was afraid to let go. We, laugh, yeah. we can laugh at him, but are we any better? We may be flying around the flame, but we're very careful not to get too close to the flame, <laughs> aren't we? <laughs> we still are not ready to uh, take the plunge and sacrifice us, ourselves in that flame, in that deep pump. We are we are holding. Mm -hmm. We are problem. We are holding. Yes. <laughs> Michael, I've got another question. Now it is said that the real self actually knows itself, or aware of itself only. It yes. knows nothing else. In that case. On one hand, if the real self is only aware of itself, on the other hand, we know that it says in the Holy Book and the scriptures of the major religions. So, sorry, I didn't catch that last bit. We know what? We know that it is mentioned in the, the major religion Holy Book of scriptures, Yes. Uh, the concept of personal God. Uh, where God creates, sustains the world, and then dissolves the world. Yes. That implies an act of doing something. Yes. While now it's actually only not doing, it's only being. Yes. So how do we reconcile that two seemingly contradictive statements? Bhagavan has explained it in, in uh, Nanya, in Who Am I? He said, just like in the mere presence of the sun, so many things happen on earth. Water evaporates, um, 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 uh, people take do all their activities. All the life on this on this planet is is occurs because of the presence of the sun. If we were further away from the sun, there would be no life on this planet. But what is the sun doing? It's just being there as it is. But one uses that as an analogy. By the mere presence of God, all these things are happening. But God is not affected by them at all. And Bhagavan, God is generally said to be all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving. To start with all-knowing, what Bhagavan says about um, omniscience, 
Sarvagnia Trum, it's called in Sanskrit. What Bhagavan says is, uh, God does know everything, but the everything he knows is only one thing, that is himself, because there's nothing other than himself for him to know. From our perspective, it seems God knows everything, but from God's perspective, there is nothing other than himself for him to know. And, and likewise, he's all-powerful, he can do anything. But actually God can't do anything, because his nature is being, not doing. Doing is, is, a, is, is an, an illusion that occurs when the ego arises. God doesn't do anything. But what Sadhuam gave a very nice analogy. Uh, Bhagavan has said that um, because there were some of Bhagavan's disciples who wanted power, who wanted Shakti and Siddhis, and if Kabiraganta and his followers, they thought they could get, if they could do mantra, uh, mantra japa, and they could get all powers and Siddhis, they could drive the British out of India, they could establish Dharma in the world. They had so many big plans. Uh, Bhagavan said, where does real power lie? Uh, real power, Shakti, is nothing but Shanti. Sadhuam gave a very, and Bhagavan wrote a small verse on uh, to that effect. And uh, Sadhuam gave a very nice analogy. Which requires more power? If you've got a, a big dam, it's holding so much water there. But, but so much power is required for that dam to hold all the water. If you breach the dam and allow water to uh, to, uh, to leak out of the dam, that's actually a reduction in power. As soon as you start doing anything, power is reduced. The supreme power is just being. So we, which which requires more which requires more power, more strength for the dam to hold the water or for the dam to crack and let the water leak out. Holding the water is the, is the, is the greatest power. It's a weak dam will, will sooner or later crack and crumble and all the water will escape. Only a very strong dam can hold all the water there. So the greatest power is only peace, just being. So in that sense, God is all-powerful because he never rises to do anything. He just is as he is. And why is God all-loving? Because he loves himself and in his view where nothing other than himself exists. So whatever else, in our view, there's, we seem to exist. There seem to be so many of us. So it seems to us that Bhagavan loves all of us. Bhagavan does love all of us but not as the people we take ourselves to be. What he loves is what we really are, which is himself. So his love is what manifests as grace and what draws us back to ourselves. Grace is, Maya is the power that draws our mind outwards, away towards the world. Grace is the the same power, but working in the opposite direction, drawing us back to ourselves. Maya is just a distortion of grace. Grace is the love we have for ourselves. That love we have for ourselves, because we see ourselves as many, we we have love for so many other things, and it, and well, some things we like and some things we dislike. The things which we think will give us happiness, we like. The things which we think will deprive us of happiness or make us unhappy, we dislike. So, but the, uh, all those things that we both like and dislike, they are nothing but ourselves. So all dualities come into being only when we rise at this ego and see multiplicity. Then knowledge and ignorance, likes and dislikes, happiness, misery, life and death, existence and non-existence, all these come into existence only when we rise as an ego. So what is the solution? Getting rid of this ego. How to get rid of this ego? Ego rises by knowing things other than itself. If it tries to know itself, 
it subsides and disappears. Very, very okay. simple philosophy Bhagavan has given us. But he didn't give it to us just to be a philosophy. He gave it to us to... We have to test it ourselves. It's a science. In science, the scientists aren't merely satisfied with the theories. They want to test the theories and see whether they actually work. So Bhagavan has given us a theory. It's for us to test it, to see whether it's actually true what Bhagavan is telling us. Bhagavan doesn't say, just believe me. He says, he gives us good reasons why we should believe him, but he said, don't be satisfied with mere belief. It is, you have to investigate and find out for yourself. So in a way, Bhagavan is the very opposite of religion, because in religions we're asked to believe things. Bhagavan asks us to question everything. Even the most fundamental things. What is our most fundamental belief? Well, obviously I believe I'm Michael. That's my most fundamental belief. Even that belief Bhagavan asks us to question. Okay, uh, if, if God simply a being and not doing, so what is the use of the prayer? What is prayer? Prayer is, what, what do we pray for? We pray for the things we like, don't we? So, it's, prayer is nothing but um, a focusing of our, our desire. Most people who pray, they pray for worldly things. They pray to get a better job, they pray to pass their exam, they pray to, um, to for, for a happy life for their family, for their children, all these things. We, we pray for so many things. We see suffering and we pray that there shouldn't be suffering, all these things. This is just, but all these prayers are directed, though we are asking God for these things, what we are, what our desire is not for God, God is just a means to our, an end. If I pray to God, oh, oh God, please help me to pass my exam, who do I love? Do I love God or do I love the exam? God is just a means. He's not the end. But if we pray to God for God himself, not for anything we can get any gain from God, but just for the love of God himself, such prayer is, is, is redirecting our mind away from other things towards God. But by, by practicing love towards God, at first we take God to be something other than ourselves. But when our mind is purified by, by practicing love to God, we slowly come to understand God alone exists. Who am I apart from God? So to know God, we have to find God in ourselves. So we have to turn our attention within. So our, our love gets directed to turn within. But when we begin to turn within, we find we have so many desires to jump outwards, to attend to other things. So if we pray to, if we pray to Bhagavan for the love to turn within, what we are doing, we are focusing our, we, we are channeling our love. Rather than trying to achieve anything in the external world, we are trying to know ourselves. We are trying to we, we're trying to develop that love to know ourselves so that that um, uh, that that is beneficial for us God doesn't need our prayers he doesn't need us to tell tell him what we need he knows better than us what we need what is good for us we pray to God for so many things but God doesn't grant all our prayers because he knows what we're asking for is not in our best interest But if we pray to him for love, that he will give in abundance. Because that's his very purpose. He, will, he wants nothing. Bhagavan is very, very selfish. He wants us only to love him. He wants all our love. He doesn't want us to he doesn't want to share us to share our love for him with our love for ourselves as an ego. He wants all, our whole undivided love. Does it mean that God actually does not hear our prayers? 
so long as we take ourselves to be a person, we take God to be a person. Now, you just asked me a question, didn't you? You think there's someone called Michael who's hearing your question and giving you an answer. But supposing in dream you were to ask someone, you would also get an answer. While you're dreaming, you believe there's a person there who is answering your question. Supposing you're in your dream, you want to go to a shop, but you've forgotten which direction. You ask someone and they tell you. You think that the person you've asked, who's giving you the directions to the shop, that they're actually aware of your question, so long as you're dreaming. But when you wake up, you know that the person who you asked, who, who, to whom you asked that question, was just your own pigment of your imagination. So just like you believe Michael is hearing your question, it's equally true that God is hearing our prayers. That is, so long as we rise at this ego and experience ourselves as his body, in effect the world is real and God is real as someone other than ourselves and other than the world. But when we wake up from this dream, we will know that neither the world nor God as, as another were real. But God is real, not as something other than ourself, but as our own self, our own reality. So at the end of it, it's the power of our attention to objects outside ourselves that's directing us outside, versus if you turn that power of attention inside, Yes. Uh, so, so Sadhu Om said a very nice thing, in, in, he wrote in Patha Sri Ramana, Atten attention itself is grace. Whatever we give attention to, that thing is strengthened. Supposing you have a, a fear, some people have a fear, say, of, um, of uh, people, people have all sorts of fears. Some, some fears are rational, some fears are irrational. Supposing you have an irrational fear of spiders. You're terrified of spiders. So every time you come in a room, you look around to see if there are spiders there. The more you think about spiders, the more that fear of spiders is being strengthened because of your attention to it. If you want to get rid of that fear of spiders, you have to just stop thinking about spiders. Stop thinking that spiders are dangerous, that spiders are going to do you any harm. So the less thought, less attention we give to something, the less strong it is. The more attention we give to something, the more strong it is. But Bhagavan has said about desire, the nature of desire is that before something is attained, even a mountain, e even a molehill will appear like, a, like Mount Meru. But once it's attained, even Mount Meru will appear like a molehill. If, if we are poor, having a hundred dollars seems to us, if someone gives us a hundred dollars, we're very, very happy. But so many things we can do with a hundred dollars. It will feed us for a couple of days, it will do this, it will do that. So for us, being very poor, a hundred dollars is very, is a big deal. But if we are a billionaire, we're not satisfied with the billions we've got. We want more billions. But if the billions, we know the billions are not making us happy. We want something more than this. So the very... It, it's, when, when something is desired, it appears very big in our view. When, when it's achieved, it's no longer a big, it's no longer a big deal. And we so want something more instead. So it's all a play of, of, of attention. If we would stop thinking that a hundred dollars is going to make us happy, even a poor man <laughs> can be indifferent to whether money comes or goes. Let it. Be, um, it, it doesn't matter. Once Kavya Gunter said to Bhagavan, uh, it seems to me that for just three rupees we can live for a whole month. Bhagavan replied, we can live without the body, why then three rupees? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Michael, um, I came across this in the, in, uh, the book, uh, Happiness of Being. Yes. So, in that, after you talk about the attention, you say that, so at the end of it, the power of attention is actually 
we we are the power of attention. Yeah, or yes. Or something well, that well, yeah. we, we, Our real nature is awareness. What is attention? It is simply a, a focusing or a directing of our awareness towards something. We, so supposing we we um, we're reading a very interesting book or watching a very exciting film. We're not aware of what's going on around because we, we're so interested in what we're attending to. So there are so many things going on around. It may be a bit cold, it may be a bit hot, it may be we may be sitting in a comfortable chair, an uncomfortable chair. We don't notice all those things because we're so interested in the book we're reading. <coughs> so we, the, though the other things are, are there, um, they don't we they don't impinge on our awareness until we attend to them. When our, our whole attention is absorbed in reading that book, we don't notice the other things. So, what attention is? It's a focusing of our awareness. So, um, awareness is our real nature. Awareness is the supreme power, chit shakti. It is how we, how this whole world is created because we see the world. Because we see it, it seems to exist. So our seeing itself is the creation. Drishti Shrishti. That's what Bhagavan taught us. Drishti Shrishti Vada. That the whole world is created by our seeing it. How the world in a dream exists. Who created the world in a dream? The one who sees it. By merely seeing that dream world, we create it. The well, dream world doesn't exist apart from our perception of it. So our seeing it, our attending to it, that is what brings it into existence. So attention is the supreme power. But we, we squander this supreme power by letting it go outwards. That, that is like uh, letting, the, um, a, 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 letting a dam crack. When the dam cracks, the water starts... Uh, flowing out and the more water flows out the more it makes the crack wider and the, and more water follows so we've got to we've got to patch up this crack now how to patch up the crack and put all the water back in the dam very very simple we simply turn our attention back to ourselves if we had love to turn our attention back to ourselves we could be we could annihilate the ego here and now so why we're still all here, why our ego haven't, why we haven't surrendered our ego to Bhagavan, why we haven't rooted it out, why we haven't annihilated it, because we don't yet want to. We want to allow our, we want to continue allowing our attention to go outwards. Well, I think, um, so the choice is ours. Who is the one that is allowing the attention to go outwards? Sorry. Who is the who is the choose I mean, who is making this choice to allow the attention to go outwards? Is it awareness that's doing it or you are making the choice, aren't you? So who are you? The one, the one who chooses to allow its attention whose attention is going outwards? It's the ego's attention. Brahman doesn't Brahman never attends to anything other than itself, does it? Atmosphere is never aware of anything other than itself. It's when we rise as this ego, but we become aware of other things. So it's only as this ego that we allow our attention to go out, but it's only as this ego that we choose to allow our attention to go outwards. So Brahman, it seems like Brahman wants to rise as this ego. Why would Brahman ever want that? Well, because that's what's happening. And that's something happened that Brahman doesn't want. Who says Brahman has risen as an ego? It's the ego that rises as an ego. If this ego investigates itself, it will see it's Brahman and that it has never risen. <clears throat> when people ask Bhagavan how this ego arose, how Maya came into existence, Bhagavan would never answer that question how. He would say, first see whether it's actually risen and then come back and ask me. If you can find this ego, you bring it to me and then we can find out how it came into existence. But first find it for me. See, Brahman never demands my attention. Always the ego is demanding my attention. 
like Brahman. If it's who who are you? Are you ego or Brahman? Well, right now I'm ego. Right. So, so you say ego is demanding your attention. That means you are demanding your attention. Because you as ego can survive only by attending to things other than yourself, you are constantly <laughs> attending to things other than yourself. So it's up no. to you as the ego. Do you want to continue suffering? Exactly. Well, Brahman isn't suffering. Brahman has no problem. It's you who have a problem. <laughs> so, so Michael, um, Michael, follow up on that question from Vikti. Um, so, so far, I have been helplessly in the webs of ego till I realized that it was ego. You follow me? I was born. I didn't know that there was a separate thing, uh, not separate, but there is the Brahman, and then the, there was the ego. I didn't know. I was helplessly uh, led in this life through the thought process without even knowing that thought itself was the culprit in the first place. Yes, okay. And, and then uh, circumstances, probably divinely ordained, led me to the understanding that there is this thought, which in itself was the culprit. Now, um, uh, so, so to her question, I think a lot of it is uh, helplessness. I mean, we, 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 I didn't even know that there was something called ego. I just was going to life until well, a point you, in the you may, you may not have You may not have used the word ego, but you were aware... Uh, <clears throat> sorry, what, what is your name? Ram. Ram. Ah. You, you were aware from pretty early on, I am Ram. Even before you knew language, you were aware of a body as yourself, weren't you? You didn't know that body was called Ram, but you, you were aware of that body. Ever since you were born, you've been aware of yourself as this body. I thought that, that was the body. Yes, yes. Who thought that that was the ego? When you say, I thought I was the body, that I is the ego. The I that thinks I am this body, that is the ego. So we're all very well aware of the ego. We're also aware, now we're aware of ourselves as I am this body. In sleep we're aware of ourselves as I am this body, but it just happens to be another body, not this <coughs> body. In dream we are not aware of ourselves as anybody at all, but we are aware. I slept. When we wake up we know very clearly we slept. But we had a, we were in a state in which we weren't aware of anything. We were mm. aware, but we were in such a state. So it has to be pointed out to us because we do it. We because we are constantly looking outwards. We mi we miss the obvious truth. So Bhagavan, so our own real self appears outwardly in the form of Guru as Bhagavan, and points out all this to us. Now it's been pointed out to us. Now we understand we have a choice. We either continue in our uh, wrong ways, going outwards, or we can turn within. And the solution to all our problems is to turn within. But because we are still, because of our, the density of our desires, our mind is still clouded. We, we see a glimmer of light in Bhagavan's teachings, but we are not fully convinced. We may be, at a, at a superficial intellectual level, we may be convinced by Bhagavan's teachings. Yes, it all makes sense, it's all very plausible. But deep down, we are still, the delusion is still very much there, very thick and dense. So how to get rid of that, 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 delu that, that, that basic ignorance, which is the very nature of the ego? We... The nature of uh, ignorance is darkness. We need light. How, where to find the light? What is the light that illumines the mind and enables it to see all this world? It is only the self-awareness, our real nature. That is the original light. So by turning our attention back within, we are turning our eyes towards the light, so to speak. And the more we turn our eyes towards the light, Eyes mean not our physical eye, but our uh, ahakan, uh, the inner eye. Kirumbiya handane dinama ahakan kan, Bhagavan says. Uh, turning within, 
daily you constantly see yourself with the inner eye the inner eye is attention so turning our attention within the more we turn our attention within the more we're bathing ourselves in light that is the real Ganga Snana what we're bathing in the Ganga the Ganga of self-awareness so if you want to have a bath in the Ganga you don't have to go away to uh, back to India you can then and uh, here and now we can each have a bath in the in the real Ganga which is the Ganga of self-awareness by turning our attention within the more we bathe in that Ganga of self-awareness the more we're bathing in light and the more we bathe in light the more our heart will be clarified and purified and the more it's clarified and purified the more clear and convincing Bhagavan's teachings will become and as a result of that we get Viveka and Viveka leads to Vairagya and to Bhakti Vairagya means the freedom from desire to attend to other things Bhakti means the love to attend to ourselves so it's a snowballing process so long as the snow is sitting on the mountainside nothing is disturbing it but when a small pebble falls from a, some ice cracks of a rock up on the top of the mountain and a pebble starts rolling down it picks up snow and the more it goes it picks up more and more and more snow it gets faster and faster and in the end it may become a big avalanche it's like that so Bhagavan has made that small stone fall and now it's now rolling down the hillside picking up snow so the more we put what Bhagavan taught us into practice the, the quicker we will um, uh, we, we, will be, we will be swept away by love for him Michael, um, totally, totally on the same page as you on, on that one. Now, uh, one comment and a question. Comment is, as you rightly said, once we, once we know that, uh, that that we are not the body, we are not the ego, we are the Brahman, then we have a choice which way to go. Absolutely on, on the same page on that one. Uh, the world does distract, and hopefully that distraction comes to an end because the world always tries to direct me. When I say world, very people close to me, not even friends, not even, I mean, I'm talking about people very close, like wife and such, where <clears throat> the focus tends to bring back to the world more and more, and that's a distraction. That's the comment. I, I know that uh, that's more rhetorical. I'm not expecting an answer there. That's a challenge. Second is, the question really is, there is a definite end to the thoughts, isn't it? As we keep, as the snowball avalanche gains momentum, the thoughts definitely will come to an end one day, correct? What is the first thought? Uh, I heard it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until the first, the, the first thought to rise is going to be the last thought to subside. The first thought to rise is the ego. The thought, I, I am this. So, there's no use in getting rid of other getting rid of thoughts is not the aim our aim is to get rid of the root of all thoughts so that's why Bhagavan says what does it matter however many thoughts arise whatever thought may arise to whom does it arise turn your attention back within so thoughts are not our enemy our enemy is the ego the one the thinker Because if thoughts were a problem, the whole world is a problem then, because according to Bhagavan, the whole world is nothing but thoughts. People say, I sat in meditation for 20 minutes with no thoughts. The, the I who was in meditation is a thought. The body that sat is a thought. The 20 minutes is a thought. The meditation is a thought. We never get away. The only time we get away from thoughts is when we fall asleep. How do we get rid of thoughts in sleep? Simply by giving up the ego. So long as the ego is there, other thoughts will be there. Because the ego cannot stand without other thoughts. For the ego, the, the first thought the ego depends upon is this body. We need some body to, to be... A, the ego is the, as Bhagavan said, the ego is the Dehatma Buddhi. The, the thought, I am this body. 
Itanu ve nanam. He says in the beginning of that verse on the um, the meaning of uh, deeper, of seeing deeper. So this body alone is I. That is the ego. So the the body is a thought. <coughs> So the ego is the first thought, but it can't rise without grasping other thoughts. So it, the, the problem is not thoughts, the problem is who is thinking the thoughts? Uh, my thought, uh, our question, uh, but if you are pure awareness, and this is, this is what we are, um, and if we are in at the beginning, say at the beginning, say a word, uh, but we're only aware of our awareness. How come we get? How come we? Our, our attention was so absolutely degenerate to actually now living in this world, so confusing to all of us. Uh, I do not understand that. To me, it's like if my genes are 100 percent of specific race. Uh, my wife is the same, and we have children. That child should be exactly of the same genes as we, but most of us are. You can, I mean, if I am Asian, my child will not come out white, right? Uh, unless something happened, and then there would be a bunch of questions to ask. <laughs> but in principle, I mean, we cannot, I mean, if something pure cannot generate into anything that is not pure, so I do not understand. So I'm, I'm missing a link here between what we are originally are and what we are experiencing today in this room. Okay, sorry, I, I couldn't hear all of that very clearly. Um, I, I, I don't quite understand what the question is. I heard little bits of it, but I didn't hear, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, uh, but yeah, uh, my apologies. Yeah, Michael, basically yeah. what I'm saying is, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you better now. What I'm saying is, uh, if we are originally only pure awareness, yes. how come that purity, how, how come that pure awareness has degenerated into what we are experiencing today in this room, basically? I mean, right. because if something is, in, in my mind, if something is pure, 100% pure, right. you cannot, I mean, there's no way it can be anything other than just pureness and nothing else. So right. if I am, if I, if my awareness is only focused on my awareness, which is what we, which, which I am, uh, which I, am uh, I really am, and nothing else, how come now I am experiencing something that we call outwards, as yeah. opposed to inwards, okay. and all okay. these things that... Okay, so, so, so basically you're, you're just, uh, you're asking the old how question. This, the, the how question was the one question Bhagavan could never answer. Bhagavan had no answer for it. So, in order to evade the answer, he would say, instead of, if you asked how it all has come, he would say, to whom has it come? <clears throat> it's come to me. So, who see who that me is. If you see who that me is, that me will disappear, and when the, the, when the me is found to be non-existent, nothing will ever have appeared and then it, it's it, uh, the question doesn't arise trying asking how is the wrong question in other words why Bhagavan couldn't answer it because in his view no ego had ever risen it's only in our view that the ego has risen and in our view that the ego is aware of all these other things so it's we who have to answer the question how did we rise at this ego? Well, in, for a start, let's have a look inside and see what is it that has risen? Who am I who have risen at this ego? If we look within and see what we really are, we'll see that we've never risen as an ego. There never was an ego, and therefore there never was any problem. See, um, um, so what I was question was how, how is a process but in being, there is no process. Nothing has happened. So that's why I think what one just says, just focus on your awareness. And then the question even won't arise. There is no, 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 hap no process there. Well, right? in any question how, 
presupposed that something has happened. What is the first happening is the rising of the ego. Has, this, has the ego actually risen? We can, we can find that out only by, by looking within and seeing who am I. When we look within and see who am I, we will see that the ego has never risen. There never was any ego. And therefore the, the, the how question is irrelevant. Thank you, Sid. Thank you. Thank I mean, I mean, is it necessarily a problem that a pure awareness of a body and a mind? Is it necessarily a problem? Does it have to be a problem? I think. I think it has to be. You're saying it's a problem. Is it a problem? We each have to say for ourselves. You I mean, we know. More, all problems come only when, in waking and dream, in sleep you have any problem. In sleep there's no problem. S problems arise only in waking. And there's nobody, there's no jiva in this or in any other world who has a problem-free life. Because every jiva takes itself to be a body. And body brings problems, disease, hunger, all these things, they, 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 we cannot have a perfectly content life so long as we experience ourselves as a body. So yes, it, there is a problem. Being aware of anything other than ourself is a problem, a big, big problem. We may not see it as a problem because we're focusing on all the little problems that come in its wake. But the root problem is, this, is nothing but this, our seeing things other than ourselves. How we see things other than ourselves by raising is this ego. So let's look at ourselves to see what we ourselves really are. Then we'll get rid of the ego and along with the ego we'll get rid of all its problems. We all know there's no living being that is free of problems. But still, which one of us is not seeking a problem-free life? <clears throat> We're all seeking a problem-free life, but we think, if I have more money, my life will be free of problems. If I have better health, my life will be free of problems. If I, we, we're looking for the solutions outside. There is no solution outside. Because the, the, very, the very looking outside is itself the problem. But no, now we're saying that if I look inside, there won't be any problem. So, so we're still seeking a solution to the problem, like saying that if I'm aware of myself, there won't be any problems. Yes. Yes. That, well, that's what Bhagavan tells us. Um, it's, um, we've tried so many other ways to get rid of our problems. What Bhagavan says makes a lot of sense. So it's worth, yeah. worth trying what he suggests and seeing whether we can get rid of our problems this way. Because all, well, uh, everyone else who, who offers <coughs> solutions to problems, they don't offer a complete solution. Because they, 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 all solutions to problems are based on the assumption if you get rid of one problem, then you'll be okay. But we know very well, whatever problem we get rid of in life, some other problem will come in its wake. So what is the root of all problems is the ego. When Bowen points it out to us, it makes it's so blindingly obvious that it's true. So since Bowen had pointed out what is blindingly obvious, but which all of us have missed, the solution he recommends is, is worth trying. Who, which doctor is to be believed? The doctor who cannot diagnose what's wrong with us, or the doctor who can diagnose what's wrong with us? We may have been searching for a a remedy for our illness for so long and we've been to so many doctors and they're scratching their heads and they can't work out what's wrong with us or they may tell us oh it's this or it's that we try their treatment it doesn't work finally we've come to a doctor who gives us a definite diagnosis your problem is that you've risen as this ego 
and not only he gives a, a, di a clear diagnosis, a clear and very convincing diagnosis, he also gives a, a very a logically sound solution. So <coughs> when all that Bhagavan has taught us is so reasonable, more reasonable than we've heard from anyone else, it's certainly worth trying what he's, the solution he offers. It may seem difficult to us because we don't have so much love to turn within, but it's certainly worth putting our best into it because we know we've been searching for solutions in other ways endlessly and we've never found any solution anywhere else. So let's at least give this solution a good try. Michael, I think it's not so much that we don't have love for it, it's it's more that we don't know how, or we don't, like, I don't, obviously the question was, don't you know who you, you are, you, not just have to say, I know who I am. You don't know how to be aware of yourself. Yeah, well, that's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, right, okay, uh, now, if that's what you're saying, when have you ever not been aware of yourself? Right now, I am not aware of myself. You're not aware of yourself? <laughs> who, who is the one who says, I am not aware of myself? You're this aware of the I who I says I'm say. not aware of myself. Well, uh, I am saying I'm not aware of myself. I who I take myself to be, this, this <laughs> physical entity. But you must be aware of I in order to say I'm not aware of myself. Not only are you aware of I, you're also aware of a myself you're not aware of. Because you're, you're using these words I am myself and saying they're things, they, they refer to something you're not aware of. That's a bit confusing, isn't it? Well, yes, it is, Michael. That's the whole thing. That problem. is the I'm nature confused. of the ego. The ego is there. The ego is a confusion. Yeah. But, I, but I, one thing we are always aware of is ourselves. Awareness of other things comes and goes. But we are always aware of ourselves. The problem is we overlook this self awareness. But our self awareness. But when often you say the self, basic self-awareness is like the screen in a cinema. The screen is always there. All the three hours we sit in the cinema watching a film, what we're actually looking at is the screen. But we don't but notice the screen at all because we're far more interested in the, in the interesting pictures with a flashing across it. Well, we're overlooking, you know, the, looking we're overlooking the obvious. Now, Byron has said, instead of overlooking the obvious, look at the obvious. Look straight at it. Look at yourself. Now we we are always self-aware. We generally we negligently self-aware because we're more interested in being aware of other things. We neglect the basic self-awareness, which is the support for our awareness of everything else. So instead of being negligently self-aware, all Bhagavan asks us to do is to try to be attentively self-aware. It's not difficult. There's no difficulty at all. What can be easier than being attentively aware of oneself? It seems difficult because we want to be aware of other things. So long as we want to be aware of other things, we are dividing our attention. We, we, we're not giving our full attention to ourselves. Michael, <laughs> in the analogy of the movie, uh, why we are more interested in the pictures because the pictures are more interesting than the screen. No, no, not that they're more interesting. It's that's all I can attempt to. Like Michael, I'm just seeing you, the plant behind you, the wall behind you. I'm not able to see the. Although I know all there is to you is the screen. Like obviously, if I want to touch you, if I go up to you and try to touch you, it's the screen. Yes. But my attention cannot attend to the screen. Like it, it doesn't have the capacity. The okay. other thing I want to pile up on, Michael, before you, <laughs> before you answer is, uh, you know, that's how I was conditioned till I got to a point that there is more than this. That's how I was conditioned. I didn't know anything better. I was thinking that, uh, you know, uh, attending to my thoughts, attending to my body, attending to my education, getting a good job, having a wife, kids, that's the meaning of this life is how I was conditioned and I was helpless because I didn't know anything better till there was a divine intervention. Till that point, if that divine intervention did not happen in my life, 
I wouldn't have known anything better. And also, the ego that we keep saying, isn't that created by God? There is no, there is no other thing other than God in this life. So, who created this ego? It has to be God. Well, according to Bhagavan, it's the ego who creates God. If you're talking about God as other than yourself, it is the ego, it is because you rise as an ego, but God appears to be other than yourself. The reality of the ego That's... and the reality of God are one and the same. As Bhagavan says in Upadesha India, Irukum ekeal isa jiva gal oru porole arba. That is, in their existing nature, God and soul are one substance. But when we rise as a soul, as an ego, we see God as other than ourself. So the God, the God as other than ourself, is created by our, our rising as the ego. The God as ourself, as our real nature, doesn't create anything, it just is. According to Bhagavan, everything is created simply by our seeing it. So because we're aware of ourselves as the ego, we have created the ego. We, the ego, have created the ego. Because we're aware of all these other things, we have created them. But uh, coming back to the, the analogy of the screen, the, the pictures are always, uh, to some extent, obscuring the screen. Though we're always seeing the screen, so long as there are pictures on the screen, we're not seeing the screen as it is. But every analogy has its limitations. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't stretch the analogy too far. One thing that we are always very, very clearly aware of, more clearly aware of than anything else, is ourself. Self-awareness is the very foundation of everything. Like you, when you ask that question, you say, I'm not seeing myself, I'm not aware of myself. How how can I not be aware of itself? The very asking of the question, it proves that you're aware of yourself. So the, the self-awareness is, is so, so obvious. Uh, apparently once in Bhagavan's uh, presence, someone was asking similar questions uh, uh, to the questions you're asking. And Bhagavan was patiently trying to explain, but the person still wasn't getting it. <laughs> and, but, and went on, so Bhagavan was keeping quiet, and finally Natanananda, Swami Natanananda, who was sitting there, turned to him and said, What are you talking about? You're stand, you're sitting there like a rock. Isn't it obvious to you? And then that and Bhagavan said, Belle, Belle, he's got it. <laughs> then only it, it struck the person. Yes, I'm overlooking the, what is most obvious. So we, we are always aware of ourselves. But in all three states, we're aware. What's the difference between waking, dream, and sleep? In sleep, we're aware of ourselves and only ourselves. In waking and dream, we're aware of ourselves and other things. So the self-awareness is the, is the substratum. It's always there. There's never a moment when we're not aware of ourselves. But because of our interest in other things, we attend to other things. We need to become interested in ourself, in knowing what we are. Not ourself as a person, but ourself as, as the mere self-awareness. That we need to become interested in. According to Bhagavan, this self-awareness, this simple self-awareness that we all experience all the time is the supreme and only reality. Yatatamai Ulladu uh, Atma Sarupam Andre. That Atma Sarupam, the real nature of oneself, is just that self-awareness which we are always aware of. But everyone said, there is nothing new to know. If Jnana were a new knowledge, what comes will go. So there is not a single person who doesn't have jnana here and now. The problem is we've got ag we've got we've got the full jnana plus agnana. We need to get rid of that agnana. The agnana comes with what? With the ego. <coughs> By investigating the ego, we find the ego doesn't exist. 
When the ego ceases to exist, it's a jnana will cease to exist along with it. So there's, Bhagavan said, in this path, it's not a matter of learning anything, it's a matter of unlearning everything. There's nothing to gain, there's everything to lose. When we've lost everything, then we have gained what alone is real. Because everything is unreal. That's why Bhagavan that? said, it, the, the verses of Old Nafta are so, so beautiful. Do you understand Tamil? No, I don't. Oh, okay. But in verse 26, Bhagavan said, if the ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If the ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. The ego itself is everything. Therefore, investigating what this ego is, is giving up everything. Right. I mean, we obviously don't understand it. But we, but we, Not yet. But no, we understand we, it, but we don't experience it. We, right. we, un we understand it superficially, but we are not fully convinced because our mind is still too clouded. How to purify the mind? Take a Ganga snana. Have a bath in the Ganga. The Ganga is not the, not that river flowing in North India. The Ganga is in your own heart. The Ganga is the self-awareness that is shining in you now as I. So am I the shining I that, you, that I say I'm not aware of. Oh. Oh. I'm a lot of yes. <laughs> right. Michael. Michael. Yes? Michael can just okay. come here and <laughs> give us this Ganga Sana. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I, I am in I'm in no better position than you. I'm in exactly the same position. I take myself to do this body. My attention is going out good. But we, we we are all fellow travelers on this path. I, I'm no better than any of you. But it's just what we just have to constantly remind us this is all Bhagavan has asked us to do. To turn within, see the light within your heart. That light will purify you, cleanse you, and transform you into itself. Because it is yourself. Michael. Yes? Yes, okay, well, go ahead. Yeah, uh, this will be my last question for today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> first, uh, first is uh, just. Uh, can the body function without the ego? Sorry? Second, can the body function without an ego? So can he's you? asking if the body can function without the ego. Right, okay. Should I answer yeah. that one first? Um, no, no. Okay. Oh, okay. Can, yeah. can the body function without ego? Right. Um, okay. Last night when you were dreaming, you had a body. And that because you, you took that body to be you, it was functioning very well. But then you left that body, didn't you? You, the ego, left that body in dream. Is it still functioning there? Yes, it's still, it's still breathing. The dream body, the body in your dream, I'm talking about now, but you, last night you had a dream. In that uh -huh. dream you had a body which you took to be yourself. When you when you woke up you left that body, didn't you? Yes. So now that body has no ego. Because you've abandoned it. So is that body still functioning? No. No. The body cannot function without the ego. Because the body seems to exist only when we rise as the ego and say this body is I. You can prove me, you can try and prove me wrong by saying, but Bhagavan's body didn't have an ego. But in whose view was Bhagavan's body there functioning? It was in the view of yourself, the ego. Bhagavan said, you take me to be this body. I don't experience myself with this body. I just experience myself as I am. So, because we take ourselves to be a body, we see Bhagavan as a body. And therefore we say, Bhagavan's body is, that is functioning without an ego. But that is only <laughs> in the view of our ego that that is true. The truth is, when the ego leaves the body, there is no body, the 
Because the, what is the body? It's a projection of the ego. Just like in dream, it, dream is a wonderful thing. As soon as you start dreaming, everything is ready-made. There's a body which you experience as yourself, and there's a world. All appears instantly, doesn't it? There's no gradual process of creation of your dream world. You rise as an ego, take a, project a body, take it as yourself, project a world. It all happens instantaneously. When, when you, the ego, subside back into sleep or come to another dream, this present dream, that dream is left behind, but dream body and dream world all cease to exist. According to Bhagavan, the, your present body and present world is just a dream. When, you, when, you, when this dream comes to an end, if the ego is annihilated, that's the end of the story. If the ego isn't annihilated, you'll just start dreaming another dream. That is what is called reincarnation, rebirth, or whatever. It, it, the simple explanation for rebirth is that every, every life is just a dream. <coughs> and so until we get rid of the root of all these dreams, until we get rid of the dreamer, namely the ego, <coughs> these dreams will continue. One dream comes to an end, another dream starts. Because we know the ego has this wonderful power to project a body and a world and to experience that body as I and that world as real. Since it's able to do so in dream, it will continue doing so until it, it itself is annihilated. So how to annihilate this ego? We, 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 nothing we can do can kill this ego. But when you say trying to kill the ego is like trying to bury one's shadow. But if, you, if, you dig, if you're fed up with your shadow following you, you dig a deep, deep pit, you see your shadow at the beginning of, at the bottom of the pit, so you happily start shoveling the dirt back in the pit, your shadow will come up on top of the dirt, won't it? So every effort to get rid of the ego is like that. But instead of trying to get rid of the ego, look at the ego and see whether it actually exists. If you look at it and see whether it actually exists, you'll find there's no such thing. So long as we, we are so long as we are worried about our shadow, looking at our shadow, it will follow us wherever we go. If we simply ignore the shadow, look at the sun, the shadow is no problem. The shadow is there only when we look at it. Why look at the shadow? Look at the sun. So if we look at ourselves, the ego will vanish. We don't have to get rid of it, we just have to we just have to turn our attention back within and it will, as Bhagavan said, Tedinal Otum Pidicum. It's sought, it takes flight. Just one more question, Sumatha. A quick, simple question. Michael, <laughs> sorry, before we let you, uh, let, let you go to the day, just one quick, simple question. Do all other uh, sentient beings have ego? Sorry? Do all other sentient beings have ego? Meaning other than humans? Other than humans. Okay. Like plants, animals. animals. Okay. In in your in your dream, how many how you see lots of people and sen lots of sentient beings. How many of them have egos? I don't know. In your dream it's your dream. <laughs> it's your dream. It's your question. One ego. Hmm? Only one ego, my Only ego. one ego, yes. According to Bhagavan, there's only one ego. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and w one, once when Bhagavan was talking about this, someone asked, but there are so many of us sitting in the hall, which one of us is the one ego? Bhagavan said, you are that. And someone else said, but Bhagavan, what about me? Bhagavan said, you are that. Which is the one ego? The one who sees this dream is the one ego. So go figure. <laughs> <laughs>